page 12 generation consumption analysis this is an engineering tool used to optimize chemical processes and minimize wastes we'll look at the solvay soda ash process as an example for how this works in the solvay soda ash process calcium carbonate from limestone is combined with sodium chloride to produce sodium carbonate known as soda ash and byproduct calcium chloride. It looks pretty straightforward on the face of it but there are actually quite a number of steps involved from going from the reagents to the products. In the first step limestone is decomposed by heating in a kiln to calcium oxide and releases carbon dioxide. That's reaction one, R1. In the second reaction calcium oxide it's called dry lime, is combined with water to produce calcium hydroxide, sometimes called slaked lime, R2. This slaked lime, or milk of lime, reacts with ammonium chloride in the third reaction to produce ammonia, calcium chloride, and water. Now the ammonium chloride is a waste product from the process and the lime recovers the ammonium chloride as ammonia to send it back to the beginning of the process. In the next step the ammonia is dissolved in water and makes ammonium hydroxide here, reaction 4. In reaction 5 ammonium hydroxide reacts with carbon dioxide to make ammonium carbonate and water. Ammonium carbonate is further carbonated, more CO2 and water added to produce ammonium bicarbonate, reaction 6. The ammonium bicarbonate reacts with sodium chloride to produce sodium bicarbonate and ammonium chloride. This is that waste we spoke of earlier that's recovered later. And in the final step, the sodium bicarbonate is dried, producing sodium carbonate, liberating CO2 and water. Now, what we want to do is combine all of these reactions in the appropriate ratios such that all of the intermediates are completely used. Any intermediate that is formed is exactly used up and there's no waste intermediate products left over at the end of the reaction. Now you can do this by trial and error. There's nothing wrong with trial and error if it works, but there is a systematic method for approaching it and I want to walk you through that. But rather than us reading the words on this page, we're going to go to the table on the next page and I'll explain it to you as we perform it. So on page 13, I have worked out what I'm going to explain in the instructions from page 12. Step 1 was to write balanced equations for all the reactions. We've already done that on the previous page. I just collected them here so we can make reference to them. There are eight reactions in this process. I labeled them R1 through R8. And here's the overall process at the top. Step number two is to list all of the compounds. Here's the formulas of all the compounds that are reactants, intermediates, or products in the process. We put them in a leftmost column in a table. Step number three is we draw a column for each of the reactions. So since we had eight chemical reactions, we have eight vertical columns. Step number four, in each column we will write the stoichiometric coefficient, that is the number of moles, associated with each compound for each balanced chemical equation. Notice the equations need to be balanced before you do this. So for example our first compound we see is calcium carbonate and you'll notice that it appears only once in all eight reactions. It is one of the reagents. The coefficient in the balanced equation is one and we write it as a negative one because it's being consumed. So anything consumed has a negative coefficient, anything produced has a positive coefficient. On the far right, we add up all the coefficients and here it's negative one, the total. Our next compound is calcium oxide. If you look at the equations, you'll see that calcium oxide is produced in equation one, one mole, so that's plus one, and it's consumed one mole in equation two, that's minus one, the net sum over here is zero. Our next compound is carbon dioxide. 
carbon dioxide you see is produced in reaction one and it is consumed one mole of it in reaction five here it is one mole of it is produced in reaction six right here and one mole is produced in reaction eight right over here so if you add up all the coefficients plus one minus one minus one plus one the net is zero for water we see that it occurs first in reaction two where it's consumed one mole next we see two moles of water are produced in reaction three on the far right there they are water is consumed one mole in reaction four here it is one mole of water is consumed in reaction six here and one mole of water is produced in reaction eight at the end when you sum up all the coefficients you find that it's not zero it's plus one for calcium hydroxide one mole is produced in reaction two and one mole is consumed in reaction three for a net sum of zero for calcium hydroxide for ammonium chloride in reaction three two moles are consumed here they are and in and in reaction seven one mole is produced over here again the sum of this is not equal to zero it's minus one for ammonia, two moles are produced in reaction three. Here they are. One mole is consumed in reaction four. And that sum is plus one. For ammonium hydroxide, one mole is produced in reaction four. And two moles are consumed in reaction five. Again, the net is not zero. The net sum is negative one. For ammonium carbonate, one mole is produced in reaction five. And one mole is consumed in reaction six. For ammonium bicarbonate, two moles are produced in reaction six. And one mole is consumed in reaction seven. For a net sum of plus one. For sodium chloride, we see it only occurs once. It's being consumed in reaction 7 for a net sum of minus 1. Sodium bicarbonate, one mole is produced in reaction 7. And two moles are consumed in reaction 8 for a net sum of minus 1. For calcium chloride, one mole is produced in reaction 3. and that's it the net sum is plus one and finally sodium carbonate one mole is produced in reaction eight it's a product the important thing to take from this is that intermediates in the process their net sum should be zero by doing this we'd minimize any waste material that we can't use so when you look at this group of equations which of these are intermediates and which of these are reagents or products calcium carbonate is a reagent Calcium oxide is an intermediate, as is CO2 and water and calcium hydroxide, and ammonium chloride and ammonia, ammonium hydroxide, ammonium carbonate, ammonium bicarbonate, sodium chloride as a reagent, sodium bicarbonate is an intermediate, calcium chloride and sodium carbonate are products. So we have 10 compounds that are intermediates, and they should all have net sums of zero. The reagents should have negative net sums, and the products should have positive net sums in accordance with the balanced equation. So how will we accomplish this? We need to adjust the stoichiometric ratios of the reactions such that all the intermediates have a net sum of zero. Now you can do this by trial and error, but there is a systematic approach that I want to show you for this. So let's write out an equation for each intermediate 
and we'll set the net sums equal to zero that we'd like to have it to and then we'll solve such that the coefficients are correct to make this happen. So I've substituted x's for r's x represent the equations r1, r2, r3 and so on simply because x looks more customary to work with as an unknown. So for ammonium chloride we can say minus 2 times R3 or X3 plus R7 we know that it equals negative 1 but we want it to equal 0 so let's set it equal to 0. So That's what I've written here minus X3 plus X7 set it equal to 0. Look at ammonia. We have plus 2 times X3 minus x4 should equal 0 but it's currently equal to plus 1 so set it equal to 0 2x3 minus x4 is 0 for ammonium hydroxide we have x4 minus 2x5 set it equal to 0 here it is x4 minus 2x5 equals 0 for ammonium carbonate, we have X5 minus X6 equals 0. Currently it does, but that's good. Ammonium bicarbonate, we have 2X6 minus X7. We'll set it equal to 0 where we want it. And finally, for sodium bicarbonate, we have x7 minus 2x8 set it equal to 0. That's where these equations come from. We took the coefficients from the balanced equation and set them equal to 0 for all of the intermediates. Now how will they become 0? Well let's just rearrange the equations see what we get. And again you could try this by trial and error but I want to show you a systematic approach so try and follow along with it here. Rearranging these equations getting rid of negative signs, we can say x7 equals 2x3. Then we can say x4 equals 2x3. Right there that tells us that x4 must be equal to x7 because they're both equal to 2x3. They're both equal to the same thing. Let's keep going here. I can say x4 equals 2x5. Now I can see here that I have x4 appearing twice, so I can say from this that x3 must be equal to x5. How do I know that? Because, well, 2x3 equals x4 and 2x5 is x4, so x3 must equal x5. Look at the next equation. I can write x5 equals x6. So that gives us another equality. We have x3 equals x5 and now x5 equals x6. This is going to simplify the calculation a great deal. In the next example we can take x7 equals 2x6. And finally we can say x7 is equal to 2 x8. Again we have an equality here. We can say that x6 equals x8. And since x6 equals x8 we can make the equality here. So x3 equals x5 equals x6 equals x8 and x4 equals x7. So now it's simply a matter of letting one of these equal to some easy number like 1 and substituting and see what the rest work out as. Now looking at all the equations, reaction 3 looks pretty complicated. That would be a nice one to set it equal to 1. So let's say the multiplier for reaction 3 is simply 1 and we've already determined that x3 is the same as x5, x6, x8 so these will all four of these will be equal to 1 and we determine that x7 is 2 times x3. So if x3 is 1, 
then x7 must be 2 since it's 2 times x3. And similarly x4 is 2 times x3. In other words x4 is 2 times 1 is 2. So I think we've established coefficients for many of our equations. So let's go ahead and put those in our matrix here. So x4 and x7 are the only two we're going to change and we're going to multiply everything by 2. This is reaction 4. x4 was set is equal to 2. So double everything up. So we'll change this to minus 2 as if you were multiplying all terms in the equation by 2. And x7, you're going to multiply all terms by 2. This will become plus 2, minus 2, minus 2, and plus 2. And now let's check our sums, our net sums now. You'll see for water, so minus 1 plus 2 is plus 1. Minus 2 is minus 1. Plus 1 is 0. Negative 1 plus 1. So the net sum for water is now set to zero, as we had hoped. Let's check out ammonium chloride. Minus two plus two is now set to zero. How about ammonia? Plus two minus two is now set to zero. And what else? Ammonium, ammonium bicarbonate. Plus two minus two is now set to zero. And sodium chloride goes to minus 2. That's a reagent, so it's okay that it's not zero. That's how many moles of sodium chloride will be consumed. Ammonium bicarbonate plus 2 minus 2 goes to zero. That's an intermediate. And so all of our intermediates appear to be set to zero, and our reagents are negative. Notice here calcium carbonate is minus 1, which it should be. Sodium chloride is minus 2, as it should be. Calcium chloride plus 1, as it should be. And sodium carbonate plus 1, as it should be. So the equations are all balanced. And furthermore, we have ratioed each equation such that all intermediates have a net sum of 0. And the process is as efficient as it can be, at least on paper. These results are shown on the next page. We have reduced the net amount of intermediates to zero, and there is no net consumption or generation. We've effectively reduced the overall eight reaction process to a single reaction. Calcium carbonate plus 2NaCl goes to CaCl2 plus Na2CO3. So this is what the ratio of equations will look like now that we've multiplied equation 4 and equation 7 by 2. We now have a situation where our net consumption or generation of intermediates is zero. Effectively, we've optimized the process.